Good afternoon, Year 7. Welcome to some more ID poetry. Um, we're going to be looking at inference, inferring things today. I'll give you the exact definition in a few slides time. But really, uh, broadly speaking, to infer something is to make um, a, an educated guess from some information that you've got. So the, the information you've got here is this picture. What can you infer from this picture? Just write a couple of lines, then on to the next slide. Our learning objective today is to read and analyse the poem about his person. It's by Simon, Simon Armitage, who's uh, currently the Poet Laureate. Um, uh, so your title is uh, About His Person. Now here is the uh, actual definition of to uh, infer. It is to make an informed guess using your own knowledge and understanding. Um, so just copy that uh, definition in. You don't need to write the bit that's in black, just a bit in red into your books. But infer definition then to make an informed guess using your own knowledge and understanding. This is a key part of uh, analysing, um, a key skill rather that you need to bring to analysing poetry. And uh, I might as well tell you now that when you come to do your GCSE, you have to analyse 15 poems. So uh, we'll start build, don't worry about that now. We'll have to start um, building those skills now. What is this poem about? This is a poem that has been written after a man has died. The writer lists all the things that were found on the man's body. About his person means things that were found in his pockets. The reader uses, them, uh, uses the items like clues to infer what has happened to them. So you'll probably be um, coming back to this part of the video or flicking back to this slide. Um, you don't need to write that down, just uh, be aware of it. We're going to read the poem together in a minute, but you've um, read it on your own there, or if you haven't, read it now. What things did he have with him the day that he died? It's a simple list of everything that he had in his pocket. There's nothing complex about it. Just list everything that he had in his pockets. That'll take you 10 minutes. And here's a list, so uh, make sure you've got them all. £5.50 in change, a library card that had expired. A library card is um, quite an old school thing, really. It's, um, you used to have to get these cards to go to the library so you could get books out. Um, a postcard that was blank but had been stamped. It means they're franking machines, as you saw uh, there, are machines that had kind of credit put into them. And you could, if you put a letter or a postcard in, it would print a print on the on the card and that would have meant that your payment your stamp was paid a pocket diary a pencil a set of keys a watch a final demand a final demand uh, in this context um, is if you don't pay for example your bills you don't pay the gas bill you get a bill through the door that says uh, you owe us this money and then they'll send you another one saying you owe us this money and then they'll send you one in red uh, which is the final demands before they do something else about it. Uh, a note written by himself, a shopping list, a photograph in his wallet, a locket with something, a keepsake inside. So if you haven't got any of those, then add them to your list. Another small test of our inference skills here. What can you infer from this picture? It's got the one dog there, it's got the can of silly string in its mouth and the other one's covered in it. Are all the clues important or is there a red herring? We'll come on to what a red herring is in just a minute. So have a look at that and see if you can see anything that looks like a clue but might be misleading. Sometimes writers put red herrings in a text to trick readers. Here we are, it's a noun. Um, a clue or piece of information which is or is intended to be misleading or distracting. So if you're having a conversation with someone and suddenly say, somebody says, the person you're talking to rather, says something that's sort of irrelevant, that's a bit of a red herring. But more importantly in texts, particularly the sort of texts like this one or um, crime novels, uh, quite often writers will put in something that's deliberately misleading. Now I want you to look back at the poem again and what clues are important and what ones are red herrings. Which ones do you think are the ones that are telling us the true story of what happened to this man? 
or and which ones do you think are irrelevant? Um, do you think the final demand for money is relevant to him being dead there? Um, do you think, you know, so go through and it's up to you, depends on, depending on what you think happened to the man, how you think that he ended up being in this position. Did he commit suicide? Was he killed? Um, I think he committed suicide. Um, so go through and see if you can find um, clues that are red headings, herrings. For example, £5.50 in change. It's not really a clue, is it? I mean, that's just a random amount of money that you happen to have in his pocket at the time. So, you know, that type of thing. Now I'll uh, read the poem for you, so follow along. I know you're fairly familiar with it now, but let's um, let's hear it out loud. Poetry is meant to be read out loud. So if you can, whenever you're looking at a poem, read it out loud. It makes a huge difference to your understanding of it. If you uh, of a poem, if you read them out loud, you'd be amazed. Reading it in your head is not the same thing. Um, about his person, five pounds fifty in change, exactly. A library card and its date of expiry. A postcard stamped, unwritten, but franked. A pocket-sized diary slashed with a pencil from March 24th to the 1st of April. A brace of keys for a mortise lock. An analogue watch, self-winding, stopped. A final demand in his own hand. A rolled-up note of explanation planted there like a spray carnation, but beheaded in his fist. A shopping list. A giveaway photograph stashed in his wallet. A keepsake banked in the heart of a locket. No gold or silver, but crowning one finger, a ring of white, unweathered skin. That was everything. Why do you think that line stands out? A, a ring of white, unweathered skin, that was everything. Is it because is it because it tells the reader that is most more most important that was everything, given that this we've decided this man committed suicide? Or is it the positioning? The last line gives it emphasis. So, I mean, it's it's we always remember the last thing we're told. The reader knows it must be important, especially as it comes at the end of a long, long list. Or is it both these reasons? Now, I want you to copy this into your books. This is uh, things that we need to think about uh, when we start analysing a poem. A writer chooses very carefully the positioning of punctuation and words in the poem. Everything in a poem has been thought about for hours, I guarantee it. The words at the start of the poem, the words at the start of a stanza. The stanzas are the little individual verses that make up the, uh, the poem. The words at the end of the poem, the positioning, you know, of the words at the beginning and at the end, it's telling a story. Words just before or after a full stop or indeed any other piece of punctuation. All these positions make the words stand out for the reader, so the reader focuses on them more. Now back to our inference skills. What can you infer from this last stanza? A ring of white, unweathered skin, that was everything. Now, have a look at those uh, pictures. Now, given that he's committed suicide and he's not got his wedding ring on, what can we infer from that? Now we're going to uh, go back and look at some uh, terminology, which is techniques, you know, the names given for techniques. Now I want you to find uh, an example of all of these. Alliteration, which is when you've got two or three words that start with the same letter uh, 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 coming one after the other. A simile, when some, you, you describe something by saying it is like something else. An emotional verb, so a verb that creates emotion. An adjective, which is a describing word. A caesura, which is a break in the middle of a poetic line. Um, an enjambment, which is when the uh, line, as you know, runs on at the end of a line without any punctuation, runs on into the next line. So 15 minutes to find examples of those in the poem. This is kind of a test which of these are language techniques and which is structure, but because of the nature of the recording, on uh, on these things uh, I have to put the the answers up there so um, just look at that and uh, we'll, we'll I'll test you properly on that at another time it's not wildly important now we're doing inference now you're seven your task for today um, which is to uh, explain you've got to choose one quotation from the poem and then explain how the technique adds to the reader's understanding of the poem so choose a part of the poem that's got a simile in it or a metaphor in it or a 
emotional verb in it or a powerful adjective and then write a paragraph um, explaining how your choice of quotation adds to the reader's understanding of the poem. Okay, so here's an example that I've done here. The writer uses the metaphor crowning to describe the band of skin on the man's finger. It suggests the man felt that being married was something special and important. His crowning glory, the most important thing in his life. So the reader understands that the missing ring would have been very significant for the man. So there we are. And this is a piece of work that I want you to uh, upload onto class charts for me, please. And I'm very impressed with the way you've all grasped the system. Um, did it more quickly than me. And uh, you, uh, so keep uploading so I can keep giving you the achievement points. And uh, I look forward to seeing your paragraphs. As I say, hugely impressed by the amount of work that I've seen this week, actually. Really well done, everybody. And uh, yeah, upload this uh, paragraph for me and I'll speak to you tomorrow. Thank you.